Good morning. It is such a privilege to be here today to talk about a topic that I cared nothing about when I was a college student, but one that has clawed and pushed its way to the center of my life by the time I'm 40, wellness. I'm going to talk today about why wellness is so hard in practice. It's hard to put the behaviors into place that we know would make us well, but it's so easy in theory. We want to be well. We want to feel good, don't we? We want to live long and happy lives. But there's this disconnect. There's a great little book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, and in it, the author says that before we change our behaviors, we have to first change the way that we think. So we're going to look at what perspectives that we hold on wellness that might need to shift so that we can make it a reality in our lives, the lives of our families, and the lives of our communities. I want to start by saying that I get that health is hard. I do a lot of lunch and learn book talks, and whenever I show up, the ladies are putting the little cakes and sweet tea out on the tables, and they start apologizing because they think I'm like the health nut there to tell them what they're doing wrong with their lives. And this makes me laugh because for most of my life, I have been about as unhealthy as a first world person could be. If you don't believe me, there's my college roommate. I think we ordered off the Arby's dollar menu our last two years in, dollar, in, in college for dinner. I was not very healthy for very long. A long time I spent making really poor decisions because health wasn't at the front of my brain. And I paid a big price for that. I want us to think about putting health at the center putting some new lenses on to look at health. After college, I embraced the healthy lifestyle of a vegetarian. White wine is vegetarian. So is uh, pizza, if you put vegetables on it. French fries are vegetarian. I'm just thankful that my mother controlled what I ate for a little while. She didn't believe in Kool-Aid or ding-dongs. I didn't even quit smoking until long after it quit being cool, y'all. So I get that health is hard. If I cobbled together the years where my mother controlled what I ate, my three pregnancies and my recent health turnaround, I may have lived about half of my life without massive disease-causing behavior. And what I want you to hear is that if I can do it, anybody can. We need to start by talking about why wellness is important. We're living in pretty incredible times right now, in a lot of ways. Most of us in this country aren't starving, right? People understand that we need to be educating our population and caring for our population. People are living so long that active aging centers are popping up all over the country, and these are good things, right? But how many of us feel well? How many of us have the level of vitality and energy that we wish we did? How many of us are dealing with some underlying condition, disease, free disease? Well, in Mississippi, the numbers are staggering. We continue to lead the nation in diabetes, heart disease, obesity. One in 12 of us are dealing with an autoimmune disorder. One in five of us are on antidepressants. And we're so familiar with these numbers, we're almost numb to them. So why can't we just get off the couch, get to the gym, quit eating the fast food, and get healthy? Well, I'm going to tell you why I think that is, based on some of my research. Wellness is not popular. Health is not popular in our culture. It's really not. In fact, it's pretty counterculture. You have to take an alternative stance. I'm not talking some like emo alternative kid. I'm talking you have to be like rogue one revolutionary to get down the grocery store aisle without something that will kill you in your cart. You have to take an alternative stance to get healthy because there's a tidal wave of culture encouraging us to be unwell. You don't believe me? Try showing up at a family reunion in the South without fried chicken. Try being the mom at the birthday party that doesn't hand out the little candy bag after we had the cake and ice cream and the Kool-Aid. You see how those kids look at you. I teach a little community class on healthy cooking, which cracks my husband up because I just learned how to cook about five years ago. And every week I hear, girl, I don't do green things. And then we all laugh, like the way that we're living isn't literally killing us. And don't get me started on church, where we go to feed our souls and our glycemic index. So wellness is countercultural, And not only do you have to make an alternative stand, 
You have to be pretty thick-skinned about it. My children's friends call me the smoothie Nazi. They know if they spend the night at my house, they have to drink the green smoothie in the morning. So they have to really want to stay. It doesn't bother me, but this is pretty pervasive in our culture. There's this lady at my kid's school who started a snack exchange. This woman faithfully carried around fruit to the classrooms and actually convinced kids to give up their hot fries and Doritos for apples and oranges. You would have thought she would win some kind of award. No, the PTO moms made fun of her. They called her the fruit lady. So you have to make an alternative stance, and you have to be pretty thick-skinned about it. And the only time I know that this happens is when you're so sick and tired of being sick and tired that you just don't care. You got to look for these instances in your life because they come, but they don't come all the time. And these are the points when you can make a change. That's what happened for me. I decided that I was so tired of being tired and sick that I was going to put my professional career as a researcher to work to solve a very personal problem. I was a qualitative researcher, which meant I gathered stories and looked for patterns. I was looking at schools that succeeded with children in poverty, the outliers, the ones who were making a difference despite all the odds. And so I took that pattern, I took that research, and I put it to work in health. I started looking for the outliers in health, the people who had lost 100 pounds and kept it off for several years, the people who put their diabetes and、um, autoimmune disorders into remission, the cancer survivors. And what I found was a pattern. And I was so excited about what I found that after I solved my health problems, I went on and figured I'd solve everybody else's too. It was really exciting, and the pattern was that people who are well see things differently when it comes to health. They wear a different set of lenses, and we're going to look at those lenses. I'm going to ask you to put those on because, like we said at the beginning, you have to change your way of thinking before you change your behavior. The first perspective change on health. Is that people who are well own their wellness. They're not out there doctor hopping, looking for a pill or a procedure or a plan that will fix them. They're becoming their own experts. They're doing their own research. They're looking at people with their condition and what they do, and they're putting those practices to work in their lives consistently. One of my more frustrating conditions has been an autoimmune condition called chronic urticaria, or chronic hives. A lot of mornings I wake up and feel like I landed in a stinging nettle bush, and it doesn't get it doesn't take very long to get tired of that. So I went to the allergist, and they gave me antihistamines that didn't work. But they sent me on to the autoimmune doctor, and the autoimmune doctor gave me steroids that made me a little crazy, but didn't work. And they sent me to the autoimmune allergist, and they gave me injections that also did not work, and sent me to the dermatologist. And at this point, I have to say, wait a minute. Am I going to keep looking for somebody else to fix me, or am I going to look at people with this condition and try to put those practices to work in my own life? Well, I'm not completely healed. At any moment, my lip could swell up like Daffy Duck, and I'm just praying that doesn't happen during this talk. But I'm a lot better than I would have been if I had kept looking for someone else to make me well. The second perspective change is that wellness is not a destination. You don't get to check it off. Wellness done. It's a journey. It's a way of life. It's not like when you go on a diet, you get to go off and keep your results. They embrace this as a journey, an odyssey, really, to make their own lives better. But what's so interesting is that people that do this, that take this journey, that embrace wellness as a way of life, they often find their meaning, their purpose in it. A great example is Dr. Terry Wall. She's my favorite physician and did the intro to my first book. She was a medical doctor who was diagnosed with、uh, severe multiple sclerosis, and she was declining so rapidly. She was about to lose her medical practice. She was in a wheelchair and、uh, sliding into dementia. And she knew the clinicians didn't have anything for her, but she also knew that it takes 30 years to get from the lab research to the clinic. And so she dove in. She owned her health, and she started a journey. She found that if we feed ourselves correctly, they will function correctly. And then, when she's not out riding hundreds of miles on her bike, she's running a major medical institute and helping other people embrace the journey. The third perception change is maybe the most important. People who are well don't see it as a punishment. They don't see it as having to give up all the joyful, great things in life. They see it as an invitation to a better life, a life full of vitality, creativity, and energy that you probably haven't experienced since you were a kid. You see this in recovering people who are really bad off. They're not moping around wondering why they can't have a drink. They're on fire for waking up in the morning and feeling good. 
and they want to share that with people. So once we understand that we have to own our health, somebody else is not going to fix us. That we have to embrace it as a way of life, we don't just get to be done with it. And that it's not a punishment, it's an invitation to a better life. Then we can start looking at specific behaviors. I want to suggest that small is sustainable and simple is good. I want to just make a few suggestions to you that might help. Water. In Mississippi, we ingest over 1,000 calories a day just through our drink. Imagine if we went 365 days and we didn't change our exercise, our diet, or our stress levels, but we just switched our drink to water. What would, do that, what would that do for the state of our health, physical health, mental health, energy levels, the state of our health? So water, let me suggest that. The second thing has to do with self-care. People who are well aren't perfect. They don't get it right every time, but they keep coming back to what they know works. They keep coming back. A couple of weeks ago, we went to New Orleans to see my husband's favorite band, U2, and I told him on the way down I was going to eat broiled fish and vegetables, and I'd been doing really well because I knew I was going to give this talk. And I did, but then the dessert menu came, and it looked really good, and everything snowballed. And by one in the morning, I'm eating Fritos out of a cheese can. You know, it was just terrible. I totally went off the rails. But I've been at this long enough, I've been at this long enough that I know the trick is to get back on track. You just keep coming back. The third suggestion is to understand stress. Stress is the underlying culprit behind almost every condition that we have. And the easiest way to lower stress is mindfulness. In Mississippi, we're a little worried about mindfulness. We think it might not be Christian or something. But let me suggest that it's actually scientific and that every major medical institute in the country has shown that 15 minutes a day on your phone, download an app, there are thousands. Do it before you get out of bed in the morning, at lunch, before you go to bed at night. 15 minutes a day. If you do that for 30 days and you don't notice a difference, give me a call. It's powerful, just lowering stress. Last thing, find an exercise that you like that you don't hate. I hate running. I only run if somebody chases me. But I love walking my dog. I like yoga because it feels like relaxing instead of punishment. Find something that rewards you, that fills you up. What do you like? Gardening? Dancing? Cleaning? Find something you like. It's a reward. It's not a punishment and you'll stick with it. And we need you to make your change. We need you to make your small change in Mississippi because these changes ripple out. They ripple out into our families. The change of one individual impacts a family, and that impacts our communities. I want to end with a little story about how that worked in my life. About five years ago, I decided I wanted to get off my antidepressants. I had tried many times over the years. I went on them when I was 20, and they were probably warranted then, but you know, 16, 17 years later, I wasn't so sure. And I didn't like having to depend on a little pill to make me well. And I tried to get off, but I would have a panic attack or fall on the floor, you know, in deep depression every time. And I got tired enough of it that it was time to make a change. Notice those cracks, those thin spaces when you're ready to make a change. And so I signed up for a class called um, 21 Days to Bliss. My friends were putting it on. And you gave up the seven major food intolerances in a supportive environment. I did not do very well in that class. I called it 21 Days to Hell. And um, I failed miserably, actually. But I noticed enough of a shift at the end of that that I bought Dr. Alejandro Junger's book, Clean Gut. And I did another 21 days. And I didn't do very well at that either. But by the end of that one, I noticed that I was onto something. I noticed enough that when my daughter, who was four years old at the time, had a health crisis that came to a head. She was, uh, had a sensory disorder. She couldn't stand the way clothes felt on her body. And we were at a crossroads. We didn't know what to do. She had to go to school, and she wouldn't wear clothes. So we had to do something, and we were considering medication for a four-year-old. But I read one line right around then in Grain Brain, the book Grain Brain, about sensory disorders and food, and I thought, maybe. And so New Year's Day, I threw out everything, and we started on the gut and psychology syndrome diet together. And that little girl who hadn't worn socks in three years, in two weeks, was fine. She's beautiful and smart and talented and fine to this day. She had two relapses that year, Halloween and Christmas. That's powerful. My little shift helped me save my daughter. And you can bet that that shift impacts my community. I used to think if we could find the right curriculum, every child could learn. I don't think so. I think our educational reform probably needs to start in the cafeteria. 
And you can bet on the most annoying PTO mom up there advocating for food and movement and extended recess. My change, help me save my daughter, impacts my community. Mississippi needs your personal change. Needs your personal change. And like my friend Nancy Woodruff says, most change starts at home and probably in the kitchen. Thank you.